Hello and welcome to Still Behind the Bench. My name is Adam and on this channel I will attempt to describe the science behind distilling spirits in a more technical way. Hopefully it will whet your appetite to learn more and teach you enough so that you're more self-sufficient. So for this video I'm going to be talking about potential problems with chlorine and chloramine in your water supply. Let's get started. Okay so chlorine and chloramine. Two types of compounds commonly used in treating tap water specifically as sodium hypochlorite or calcium hypochlorite when it comes to chlorine or monochloramine when it comes to chloramine you know if you're on a well you probably don't have to deal with it unless you add it yourself which i have seen done but for the rest of us we may end up with issues when it comes to one of these two compounds they're added to the municipal water supply in amounts such that if the water is sitting somewhere in a pipe for some given amount of time the amount of chlorine or chloramine in that water will stifle or eliminate the growth of microorganisms, which gives it its industry used terms of residual chlorine or residual chloramine. So my local water treatment facility uses chlorine. Yours might also, or they might use chloramine because it's less volatile. With chlorine, it will naturally just evaporate out of the water over a few days. Chloramine, that doesn't happen. Either way, both of them can cause the same issues. Namely, depending on the concentration in the water, they can cause the creation of a particularly off-tasting flavor, or they can damage your yeast. There are a bunch of ways you can remove them if they're at high enough levels to be uh, an issue. Okay, so the main issue with chlorine and chloramine in your water is going to be the creation of this phenolic compound here, 2,6-dichlorophenol, sometimes referred to as DCP. A major problem with the creation of this compound is you won't really know until you're finished distilling. Uh, in beer and wine it's called it's considered a tainting compound. Some people enjoy the flavor of DCP especially when it's part of a, a scotch whiskey from uh, Isla, the Isle, the Inner Hebrides Islands off of the coast of Scotland. Mostly because it is actually also created during the drying process of malted barley when they use peat smoking. Specifically, this DCP compound has a sort of antiseptic, sterile, maybe even a band-aid flavor, so smell and taste. And in my opinion, most spirits do not benefit from this flavor, but sometimes these scotch whiskeys can pull it off. Luckily for us, it comes out usually in the middle to the end of the tails or faints. In Isla, when they're distilling, they refer to the tails as faints instead of tails. So you know if you get this flavor and you weren't using a peated malt then you will know the most likely culprit is that it came from some time when you were adding water. So when you're adding water just before you started to ferment, when you were making say a starter for your yeast, uh, when you're diluting for the low wines if you're doing both a spirit run and a or sorry both a stripping run and a spirit run. Sometimes people use bleach as a sterilizing agent to sterilize your equipment. If you don't rinse properly you can create this flavor as well. The second major issue can be during fermentation especially if you create a starter and you use just straight tap water that you can have a sluggish start to your fermentation the chlorine or the chloramine will damage some of the yeast cells really when it comes into contact with the organ organic compounds so the yeast or sugar or nutrients it'll start reacting with them so to, to reiterate it can kill your yeast most likely it's not going to kill your yeast because your yeast start producing antioxidants, specifically a compound or a, yeah, a compound called glutathione. We produce it as well. It's an antioxidant. So what it's going to do is sacrifice itself to uh, the chlorine or chloramine molecules. But this antioxidant is a tripeptide and one of the amino acids. So peptides are just small chains of amino acids. In this case, glutathione has a cysteine amino acid in it. That cysteine amino acid has a thiol group which is just a sulfur bonded to a hydrogen and this thiol group is very susceptible to being oxidized. So that's how this uh, tripeptide glutathione is able to sacrifice itself and make that chlorine or chlorine molecule inert by reacting with the thiol group in this glutathione. So realistically the only time you're gonna have to uh, worry about chlorine or chloramine being a problem is when you're making a starter, if you just use straight tap water. Uh, if you're adding that 
tap water to a wort or a must just prior to fermentation and when you're diluting the low wines from your stripping run when you're going into your spirit run. Technically, there should never really be enough chlorine or chlorine, chloramine in your water to completely prevent a fermentation from happening. Um, to put this into numerical values, you really don't want more than one milligram per liter or one ppm just to be safe. I mean, just for your fermentations and your distillation to be safe. To give you some comparisons, pools are typically treated to three milligrams per liter or three ppm. My region has 0.9, as I showed, and I've never had any issues. There are water, there are drinking water quality limits in most countries. Uh, maximum allowable levels of residual chlorine or chloramine. In Canada, it's 2 ppm. In the UK, it's 3 ppm. In the US, it's 4 ppm. And in Australia and New Zealand, it's 5 ppm. I know these values from a few years ago, so they might have changed. And if they changed, hopefully they've gone down. And just to know that these values aren't what's going to be present. They are just the maximum values that the government will allow. So let's get into how do we get rid of chlorine and chloramine. Okay, so how do we get rid of them? Well, you can use both chemical and physical methods. I'm going to talk about the physical methods first. In the case of chlorine, you can literally boil it and let it sit overnight. And in the morning, the concentration will have either dropped to zero or dropped low enough that you won't have any problems at all. And technically, you can just let it sit out for about 72 hours and the levels will have dropped more than enough, if not completely, depending on how much was there in the first place. Unfortunately for chloramine, though, boiling doesn't work because it's not volatile enough. The second physical method, although technically it's a chemical method, would be using uh, granulated activated carbon or just activated carbon. I call it physical because you can reuse this activated carbon multiple times, but I'm going to note that activated carbon doesn't work on chlorine and chloramine like it does regular organic molecules. When it's removing chlorine and chloramine, it's actually reacting with it. So the surface of the, the granules is reacting with the, the chlorite molecule in chlorine or the chloramine molecule in chloramine to produce either carbonates or less likely it'll actually produce carbon oxides like carbon dioxide. And in both cases, it removes the oxidizing ability of the chlorine or chloramine, which is how it's going to cause issues in your fermentation or distillation. So for chlorine specifically, you want to get a granulated activated carbon that has a 20 by 50 mesh size or higher. So when I say higher, I mean the first number has to be higher than 20 and the second number would have to be higher than 50. Now, normal granular activated carbon works great with chlorine, but doesn't work very well on chloramine at all. And the reason is, is that the chloramine needs a longer time to react with the activated carbon. So, I mean, you might be able to pour granulated activated carbon into, you know, a bucket with the water and maybe leave it overnight and it'll work. But you'd have to figure out a way to stir it so that they come into contact all the time. Another thing you can do, though, is if you're going to be buying a activated carbon filter or making one out of PVC or stainless steel or whatever, is if you know your water treatment uses chloramine, you can buy catalytic activated carbon instead, or sometimes it's just referred to as catalytic carbon. And it has had the surface treated so that it can more easily react with chloramine or chlorine. Another thing you can do is just skip granular activated carbon or granular catalytic activated carbon altogether and move to the vastly superior carbon block filters, also known as a CTO filter. Essentially what they've done is they've taken uh, powdered activated carbon, they've compressed it into a cylinder, like a cylinder shaped with a blocked hole in it, and then they put it in a filter housing, sort of like a reverse osmosis. Pump the water in under pressure, it passes through the wall of this carbon block, and then it comes out the output, and it'll remove essentially all the chlorine or chloramine and quite a few other compounds that you'll find in water at essentially any any value you'll ever see. And these are really the only two physical ways that you can remove chlorine or chloramines. Now we can get on to the uh, chemical methods. Okay, so finally we get to the chemical methods. There are numerous chemicals that you can use technically, but I can really only recommend four of the chemicals that I know that can do the job. They are ascorbic acid, sodium ascorbate, sodium metabisulfite, 
and potassium metabisulfite. So ascorbic acid is also known as vitamin C. A lot of people probably take it every day. Uh, sodium ascorbate is just the sodium salt of ascorbic acid. Then sodium and potassium metabisulfite are also known as Camden powder or Camden tablets. Uh, it's often used to sterilize water from uh, microorganisms. In terms of recommendations of which one to go with, I'd say if you don't have any of these yet already, I would start with the ascorbic acid or the sodium ascorbate just because you can't really overdo it with these two. If you put in too much of the metabisulfites, especially during fermentation, you'll end up killing all your yeast. And if you put in too much during distillation, you'll have a bunch of extra sulfites, uh, which could lead to the creation of sulfur-based compounds like uh, the uh, was it dimethyl trisulfide that I talked about in the last video. So for the ascorbic acid, you only need to put in 2.48, essentially 2.5 milligrams for every milligram of chlorine or chloramine that's present in the water. For the sodium ascorbate, it's 2.78, so 2.8 milligrams per milligram of chlorine or chloramine. And then for both the metabisulfites, it's only 1.4 milligram per milligram of chlorine or chloramine. Again, with the metabisulfites, you sort of have to be careful. You don't want to put in more than 65 milligrams per liter and I wouldn't even get anywhere close to that value uh, which, which is so 65 milligrams per liter is roughly 1.24 grams per five gallons or 19 liters or roughly a, a quarter teaspoon or I should say just under a quarter teaspoon in a five gallons of water or 19 liters in fact I would try to stay under 20 I don't think you'll ever need to use any more than that but just keep it in the back of your mind in terms of actual values I have used I've gone as high as 500 milligrams and 19 liters for ascorbic acid. And that's mainly because my scale is a piece of garbage and it only measures in 100 milligram increments. And when I was measuring it out, I spilled some and nothing went wrong. So I figured 500 milligrams in 19 liters is probably a good upper limit for ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate. The only problem with ascorbic acid is that since it's a weak acid, it will lower your pH. That could be a good thing if you're just starting your washout and you want to lower your pH in the first place, or it could be bad if you don't want your pH to drop anymore. Sodium ascorbate shouldn't adjust the pH, uh, neither should the metabisulfites. But yeah, I'd stay under 500 milligrams for these two. And for these two, try to keep it under 20 milligrams per liter, or I've gone as high as 300 milligrams in five gallons or 19 liters. I don't know what that would be in milligrams per liter. That would probably be um, maybe 15 probably about 15 milligrams per liter. Anyways, yeah, so the metabisulfites you have to be more careful with when you're dosing. These two you don't. I found that if you go to wine and beer stores, you're not gonna find these two. You will find the metabisulfites though, because they're very popular in the wine and beer industry to kill the yeast, especially in the hobbyist, because they may not want to buy expensive filtration equipment and they don't want yeast. They may not want yeast to continue fermenting after bottling, especially wine. And that's it for this video on chlorine and chloramine in your water supply and uh, what it can do and how to treat it if it, uh, it becomes a problem. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please click like and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. I keep saying this is because uh, not only lets me know that you like the content, but it also lets YouTube know and they will start recommending the videos to other people and the channel can grow. So have a great week.